Baptist Church. We're so glad to see you here. Um, before we get started, I do a few brief announcements. Um, you can listen, you can read along with those in your bulletin. So this week we have um, praise band rehearsal on Monday, 6.30, and mission board via Zoom on Tuesday, also at 6.30. Uh, continuing from that, uh, being on the back, we have praise band rehearsal again on the 8th and 22nd, also at 6.30. Parishall Ministry will be 9th and 23rd. That got moved to Tuesdays for anyone who is interested or involved. Um, August 11th, we have the Women's Lunch. If you're interested in that, there's a sign-up sheet downstairs. Um, the Investment Committee is going to be 11, um, August 15th at 5.30. And then at 6.30, there will be an Executive Board meeting. August 18th is the Men's Lunch. And if you're interested in that, please talk to Pastor Beth. All right. Uh, so if you'll stand with me, we're going to be singing Mighty to Save. Uh, please sing along. You have an answer in your heaven. <laughs>
thank you, Lord Jesus, for your great love and mercy you poured out on us and for your power which you showed, all of it, on the cross. When you gave yourself for us and poured out your blood that we might be forgiven and have our sins washed away. Thank you for wanting us, coming and going to the cross to be reconciled to us, that our sins might be forgiven, that we might be able to be your children. Father, pour your spirit out on us this morning as we worship. Draw us close to you, so that when we go from this place in a little while, we would be renewed, we'd be refreshed, We'd be ready to go out into the world, into our lives, and be your disciples, sharing your love with all the people around us, sharing your good news, and living lives that are pleasing in your sight. Father, empower us, we pray, during this time together to go forth and do those things, that we might be your servants always. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Savior who, when he was on the earth, taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the the glory glory forever. forever. Amen. 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 Please be seated. We have a uh, about seven minute video today on uh, to give you some information on one of the uh, missionaries that our church supports, the Clemmers. They are in Uh, DR uh, Congo, they're in the Congo, and they are working as medical missionaries and also spreading the word of Jesus. So I'm going to show this video. I hope you all can see the screen, and uh, after that we'll take our offer.
this is Bill Clark and Sussman. Hey, I talk. That's a tough act to follow. And ask me to talk a little bit about the work that uh, I've been doing here um, on the mission field. Uh, we came to mission field at the end of 1992, so we're entering uh, or just finishing our, our 29th year of service. And, uh, you know, when we first came on the field with three young children and one on the way, we had this vision that God wanted us to work in schools and hospitals as doctor and teacher. And I must say that uh, one never knows what God has in store for you. But what I can say is it has been such a blessing and a, and a distinct privilege to serve Him in the many areas of ministry in countries and, and, and venues from Haiti to Zaire to Congo to the refugee camps of South Sudan uh, this, these past couple of months. I've been working on the Congo Rwanda border, taking care of the many victims of our recent Ebola outbreak, and I leave next week for the country of Somalia uh, to work with doctors and nurses there. And I guess that I would say that throughout it all, God has been so faithful. He's been so good. He's kept us well and safe, focused on His promises, and given us everything we could ever ask for. We want to thank our partners, uh, our faithful churches and friends in the U.S. for making it possible for us to be here for your prayers, for your love, and for your support. We want to end this by giving God the glory and the honor. It is truly His. It has been a blessing to serve Him, to serve you, for the people here in Africa, and all that God has in store for us. Thank you for being with us this afternoon from Goma and the, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. I don't know why he got cut off at the end there a little bit. That was the end. So if you would like to give to support the Clemmers, Dr. Bill Clemmer and his wife Ann in their work, um, that you can give through the white envelopes in your pews or uh, just put something in the plate marked um, for the Clemmers. And uh, we support them year-round, so you can give any Sunday. Now I'd like to invite our ushers to come forward to receive this morning's offer.
Would you please stand for the doxology? Father, we praise you and we thank you, for we know that all the blessings that we have in our lives are gifts that have come from you. Thank you for all of them. But most of all, thank you for Jesus, your Son, our Lord, who saved us when he went to the cross. Help us, Lord. Bless these gifts and guide our hands as we use them, that the good news about him, that that message might be in our hearts and on our lips and go out with us everywhere you send us, that we might see revival in our own lives, in our churches, in our communities, and in our nation. Lord, pour your spirit out, we pray, in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. verses 1 to 22, if you want to follow along. It's on page 1163 in your pew Bible. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about twelve men in all. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick, and their illnesses were cured, and evil spirits left them. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Seba, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day, the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and I know about Paul, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed their evil deeds. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachma. In this way, 
the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. After all this had happened, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem, passing through Macedonia and Achaia. After I have been there, he said, I must visit Rome also. He sent two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, to Macedonia while he stayed in the province of Asia a little longer. May the Lord bless the reading of this is holy word. Amen. Thank you, Richard. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O holy God. Lord, speak a message this morning by the power of your Holy Spirit, we ask. In the name of Christ, amen. So we're continuing through the book of Acts, and we've been preaching through the book of Acts for at least a year, from the beginning, and we're up to uh, Acts 19. And um, in Acts 19, God is doing all these amazing things through Paul in Ephesus, as he preaches and he teaches the good news and the scriptures. And after many lectures in the hall of Tyrannus and a number of miraculous signs, something amazing happens in the city. There's a mass turning to the Lord. A mass turning to the Lord. If such a thing happens today, we call it a revival. What would that look like, a revival? What would that be like if one happened today? We've been praying for revival. Many Christians have been praying for revival in our nation and in our community. And we've been praying for revival in our church and in our hearts for a long time now. What does revival look like when it comes? Well, if we take a look at what happens in Ephesus in our passage today, I think we can see at least some of the things that we could expect to happen when revival comes to a community or to the heart of a person. First... When revival comes, people fear the Lord. Let me say that again. When revival comes, and everybody stops looking at Mary Beth Levy. When revival comes, see, I, I've got everybody's attention back by doing that. You see that? Every, everybody. When revival comes, people fear the Lord. People fear the Lord. Verse 17 of our passage says this. They were all seized with fear. Who likes that word fear? Nobody likes fear, right? We don't want to be afraid. There's a famous quote in Proverbs 1, 7, right? The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. But whenever, one's any, whenever anyone quotes that, immediately we feel the need to qualify it, right? We want to say, well, it, it doesn't really mean fear. It means respect, right? Who has, who's ever said that or heard someone say it? Or just heard me say it. Everyone should raise their hands on that one. Well, I, I, and I guess that's true. It is true. I mean, but only because we know more information about God. We know that he loves us and that he's merciful to us. So we don't really have to fear him if we know Christ. But on the other hand, do you know what the Greek word that's translated fear in that, in our passage is? They were seized with fear. You know what it is? It's a word you know. Phobia. That's the name, that's the word. Phobia. It's phobos, actually. But we get our English word phobia from that word. Like arachnophobia, right? Which is the fear of spiders. Anybody here a little bit of arachnophobia? Mary Beth left, so. Um, how about agoraphobia? I have this one. What's agora? What's that? The fear of heights. Fear of heights. Agoraphobia. No, no, thank you. No, thank you. I'll stay right here on the ground. Thank you very much. This is high enough for me. Do you know there's also um, theophobia? What do you think that might be? Fear of God. The fear of God. Did you know that? Except that's not a neurosis. It's the beginning of wisdom, our scripture says. Why do people fear those things? Are they totally irrational fears? Not really, because, I mean, spiders and heights, those... Those can be dangerous. Like, spiders sometimes can be poisonous, you know? I mean, people can occasionally even die from, like, the bite of a brown recluse or something. 
Right? And heights, heights are deadly if you fall. What about God? Can he be dangerous? C.S. Lewis, I'm sure you are familiar with him, he wrote famously the Chronicles of Narnia, right? The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and all you read those when you were a kid. You remember the huge lion in the, in the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? Aslan? Well, C.S. Lewis famously wrote in those books, he made the point to say often that Aslan, this huge lion, this scary lion, is not a tame lion. And of course, Aslan is meant to represent God and Jesus, not a tame God that we can control or that will sit nicely where we tell him to. He's in charge, not us. Is God dangerous? Yes, he can be. He's dangerous to sinners. Uh-oh, wait, are we sinners? I've got a scary verse from the Bible for you today. Who's ready for a scary verse from the Bible today? We, we, it's fun to have a scary verse from the Bible once in a while, right? This is actually the words of Jesus from the end of the parable of the wheat and the tares. Matthew 13, 40 to 43. You ready? Brace yourselves. Here it comes. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. That's not from the Old Testament. Those are the words of Jesus. Is God dangerous? Yes. Yes, God is dangerous. When revival comes, people will come to understand a few important things. First, that God is real. Second, that he's holy and that he punishes sin. And third, that we will answer to him for how we've lived our lives. And when you realize those things and truly believe them, how can you not be at least a little bit afraid? Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We've spent so much time in the church in recent years trying to make God more palatable to the world, to non-believers, that we've forgotten that there really is a danger for those who will not repent and turn to him. God is not the one that we need to change. We need to change ourselves and turn to him and be forgiven by the blood of Christ. And even as believers, we continue to fear the Lord in the same way that, you know, you feared your dad growing up because you knew he wasn't going to put up with foolishness if you did something wrong, you better repent quick, right? Better that dad finds out about it from you while you're in tears and apologizing at the same time, right? And maybe you'll get some mercy, or, because dad resists the proud, but he lifts up the humble, just like our heavenly father does. Why? Why was it like that with your dad? Because he loved you. He loved you enough to be willing to discipline you. So you could grow up to be the good, mature, and capable person that you are today. What happens when dads either don't discipline their kids or aren't around to do it? Well, just look around at our culture today. And you can see what happens. Now, the Bible says that perfect love casts out fear. Of course, that assumes that there's some fear in the first place to be cast out. Love can't cast out fear if it wasn't there to begin with. That's why the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Fortunately for you and me, there's more wisdom to come than just that. And that wisdom is that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. So then the only fear left for believers is the fear that we might hurt God. The God we love. We might hurt him with our actions and attitudes. Just like you don't want to hurt your significant other's feelings or disappoint them. As believers, we seek to please God in all that we do so as not to grieve him, to grieve the Holy Spirit that he's given us. If a time ever comes in this nation and in this culture or in this community where people begin to take God more seriously, when they begin to take the destination of their eternal souls more seriously, when they take faith more seriously, when they fear the Lord, then we will know 
that revival is at hand is the same true for us as individuals. Do you fear the Lord? Do you want to please him in all that you do? Does your life as a believer please him? Or does it hurt him? When revival comes to a nation, to a culture, to a church, or to a heart, people begin to fear the Lord and then seek to be reconciled to him. Secondly, when revival comes, the name of the Lord Jesus is held in high honor. Right? Verse 17 of our passage says this, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. When revival comes, one of the first things that you'll notice when revival comes is how infrequently you hear the name of Jesus used as a swear word. When revival comes, you'll begin to notice how infrequently you start hearing the name of Jesus used as a swear word. When revival comes, people will still hit their thumbs with hammers. People will still stub their toes in the dark in the middle of the night. People will still get cut off in traffic. But there are two words that will not come out of their mouths once revival has come when that happens to them. And that's the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. I have realized, actually, that you can take the name of Jesus into almost any setting in our modern culture. Did you know that? You can take the name of Jesus into almost any setting in our modern culture. Even in today's anti-Christian culture, you can. At work, in government, at college, maybe even in high school, you really can speak the name of Jesus Christ in those places as long as you're using his name to swear and curse. They won't have a problem with that. Our culture is fine with you taking the name of Jesus with you anywhere you go, as long as you take it in vain. But when revival really comes and people fear the Lord, when revival comes and people turn to him and they come to know and really understand who Jesus is and what he did for them, and they love him for it, then they will respect his name. Do we? No one will dare to take his name in vain as they do now so easily, for either they will love him too much, or they will be surrounded by too many friends and loved ones who love him, and they won't want to hurt their feelings. When that happens, you'll know revival has come. Does that need to happen in our hearts and in our lives? And Christmas and Easter will again become the most important holidays in our culture. I don't mean the secularized versions of them either. It won't be Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny that people celebrate during those seasons so much. It will be Jesus Christ in his name. You will hear Merry Christmas everywhere with hardly a happy holidays to be found. And Easter will actually be a big deal again. Rather than just another excuse for people to gorge themselves on food and candy. Isn't it funny? Don't you think it's funny? How all our holidays have morphed into like feasts in which we see how much we can eat. I think about it, right? Thanksgiving, Easter, Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, Super Bowl Sunday. Wait, how did that get in there? <laughs> St. Valentine's Day, the 4th of July, right? All, all we, it's all become about eating, right? It reminds me of something Paul once said about those who turned away from the Lord. He said, their God is their stomach. And of course, when I point my finger out at you, I'm pointing three fingers right back at myself on that one. When a revival comes, people will get serious about the name of Jesus. They will respect his name, and they will respect him, and they'll hold him in high honor. Thirdly, when a revival comes, people will repent and confess their sins and change their lives. Verse 18 and 19 of our passage, we learn that the new faith of these people in Ephesus has real consequences in their lives. They want to change their lives for the Lord, and they do. When revival comes, people will repent of their sins and confess them. Many will even want to confess their sins, ready, wait for it, publicly. Let me ask you this question. Just think about this for a moment. What level of passion for the Lord and zeal for him would it take for you to stand up and confess your sins publicly in front of people. 
I'll, I'll keep working on it in my life too, okay? Because <laughs> that would be quite something. You'll notice I didn't say they have to confess them publicly. I say they will want to. They want to. Why? Because they are changing their lives. They're making a break from that old person they were, and now they're starting a new life following Jesus. They're turning away from their former sins to follow the Lord and live his way. It's almost like they're being born again to a whole new life. And many will want to tell everybody about it. I used to be involved in this and such a sin, but I'm leaving that all behind to follow Jesus who saved me. They'll be excited to tell you what kind of awful person they used to be and how Jesus saved them and changed them and cleansed them and now they belong to him. What about us? Is it too late for us to have that kind of attitude, that kind of excitement in following the Lord? We could never confess our sins one to another, as James says in James 5, 16. We've been Christians way too long for anyone to find out that we're still struggling with that one sin, right? Right? So we have to keep fighting it in silence and keep losing in silence. Well, let me just say this. If that describes you at all, and it probably does because we're all sinners that still fight, but I want you to know that you can come and talk to me. Not only will I not judge you, I will help you fight. For I know well the parable of the unmerciful servant, and God has forgiven me of much. We're all in the same boat when it comes to sin, but let's not be content to just drift wherever the current takes us. Let's take up the oars and row vigorously towards righteousness and godliness, making a break with the sins of our past and following the Lord toward the holiness of our future in heaven. You know, I've been a Christian for most of my life and a pastor or a youth pastor for more than 20 years. And as all that time has gone by, and I've worked with many different people, and I've seen what has happened to our world and our culture over the course of my lifetime, and heard the messages that our culture, and unfortunately some of the church, has been putting forward during that time, I've come to realize one simple thing, I think. It's nothing new. No big, new, profound thing. You're going to say, gee, that's all, Pastor Jeff, when I tell you it. It's just a simple truth. Why are we here? On this fallen world. What is God's purpose for all of this? What is he really doing? We only live for a century or less. Such a short time. What's going on? What is this short life for? I believe that we are here in this world so that we can answer one simple question for ourselves. We are here in this world. Your life exists so you can answer one simple question. And not just answer it intellectually, but show it in your life. And that's this. Will we choose God over everything else? Will we choose God over everything else? Will we choose to love him, choose him, choose to ally ourselves with him, choose to be loyal to him, make him first over everything else? Why is there so much anxiety causing unsurety in our lives? So that we can choose to trust God over it. Why is there so much pain in our lives so we can choose to love God in spite of it? Why does God give us commands that we don't want to follow so we can choose to follow God rather than ourselves? We can choose his will over our will, like Jesus said in the Garden of Gethsemane. Not my will, but yours be done. What was he facing in that garden? Why does God allow besetting sins to plague our lives so we can choose whether to fight them or give in to them, to seek to be obedient to him because we love him, or make excuses because we love our sins more than we love him. Friends, if we make it to heaven, we're going to live with God there forever, with God, in his presence. We're going to live in his presence as his friend, as his child, as his companion forever. How are we going to do that if we don't trust him, love him, follow him, and obey him? How are we going to do that if we don't trust him, love him, follow him, and obey him? Will we do those things? That's what we're deciding right now in these 70 to 100 years of life that we're given on this planet. And God's given us a bunch of help. He sent Jesus' son to die so that we would have a million chances to make that choice. Literally, maybe more than a million. Every second that we're alive, we have a chance to repent and turn to Jesus. 
Jesus made it like that. So that every time you have a thought, it could be, I'm going to change and turn to Christ. How many thoughts can you have in the rest of your life? A lot of them. Every one of them is a chance that God has given you to change your life, to turn to him, to love him, to follow him. We have all those chances because he died for us. And every second that we live as believers, we have a chance to move forward in our sanctification, too. We have all those chances because the blood of Jesus covers our sins, makes up for our mistakes, and inspires us to make the right choice going forward. The decision to love him who loved us, first and foremost, and above all things. When people are repenting of their sins, left and right, when people stop making excuses and start choosing God first over everything else, then you will know that revival has come. When you look around and see that happening, you'll know. And when you find yourself doing those things, you'll know revival has come to you, to your heart. When revival comes, we will see people repent and confess their sins and change their lives. Fourthly, when revival comes, people will turn away from the love of money. When a revival comes, people will turn away from the love of money. Verse 19 of our passage says, A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. Money is the root of all evil. can't let that verse stand like that, can we? <laughs> See, here we go, right? It's not money, it's the love of money we feel compelled to say, right? And we're correct, of course. I mean, 1 Timothy 6.10 does indeed say that the love of money is the root of all evil, not just money itself. But wait, we, we, we feel to compelled to say more than that, right? It's not the love of money is the root of all evil, it's the mon love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Right? That's, that's the way we like that verse to be. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. See? Okay. That's correct. Again, that is the proper translation of the Greek. The only question I want to ask is, why do we feel so compelled to correct that verse every time we hear it? We just want to get our theology right? Is that it? Maybe. Okay. You know what Freud would say, right? Guilty conscience. You know, because we don't love money. We just like it a whole lot. You know, sort of like how teenagers, teenagers say they like someone. Is there a boy you like? Do you like that girl? That's, we like money. And we have to say that money is only, uh, and we have to say that money is only the root of all kinds of evil because when we have it and we use it, we only use it for good, of course. Right? I know I do. Our culture loves money, and that might influence us. Jesus said you can't serve two masters, you'll hate one and love the other, you can't serve God and money. And our culture listened to him, they listened to that message, and they took him to heart, and they abandoned him to worship money. What's the American dream? What is the American dream? What was it in the beginning? What did the pilgrims think it was? To get rich, is that what they said? To get rich, is that what they came here for? They want to get rich? They want to be richer than their parents? No. What did they want? They wanted to build a shining city on a hill for Jesus Christ. Yeah. That's what they wanted. That was the American dream to them. Yeah. Not that uh, they have a bigger house than their parents did. What, trumps, what issue trumps all others in every election? Is it religious freedom? Is it God's morality? No, it's the economy, isn't it? Especially if it's not doing well. It's the economy, stupid. Maybe stupid is the right word. Now, it is an important issue. I'm not saying it's not, because many people live paycheck to paycheck and can't afford for gas to double and heating oil to double and triple in price, right? Many people don't have the margin to deal with 9% inflation. But for many others, it's not about making ends meet. It's about how much the investments grow or shrink and what kind of vacation we can afford to take. When revival comes, people will care much less about money. The sorcerers of Ephesus, they come together to Paul and the church with all the books and scrolls that contain all the evil and demonic things that they were doing, and they burn them. 
Here's a side question. Could someone who has made a deal with demons still be saved by Jesus Christ? Looks like it, doesn't it? Because that's what all these sorcerers have done. And yet they were saved. So don't let anything come between you and faith in Jesus, no matter what lies you've been told. So they no longer want to be sorcerers. They want to follow Jesus, their Savior. So they take these scrolls and they burn them, even though their worth was 50,000 drachmas. A drachma is about a day's wage. So in today's terms, that would be 192 years worth of wages, or about $10 million worth of books. Wouldn't it have been better just to sell them and keep the money? I mean, these, these scrolls were like an investment. Don't just burn them. I can, I can just hear Judas saying, right, why weren't these sold and the money given to the poor, right? Imagine how much that money could have helped them build the church, right, or, or protected them under persecution. How many lawyers could it have hired to protect them? At least two. But they didn't think they needed that money. They didn't think they needed money for protection or for help. Why not? Did they have something better than money? Yeah, they had the Lord. The Lord is a lot better than money. Because money perishes. But his kingdom is forever. And I think they'd rather um, have him. They'd rather have Jesus. And silver or gold. They'd rather have him than riches untold. They'd rather have Jesus than houses or land. They'd rather be led by his nail pierced hand. Sing with me. Than to be the king of a vast domain, or be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than Anybody got any idea why they burned them rather than selling them? I think it was because they didn't want anyone else being corrupted by those books and scrolls either. It's an act of repentance, but also an act of love. They didn't want to profit by hurting other people. If you ever see people choosing to follow God over money, choosing to make tough decisions, it's going to cost them financially, but they know that it's what the Lord wants them to do. When you start seeing that everywhere all around us again, like maybe it once was. Then we'll know that revival has come to our land. When revival comes, people turn away from the love of money. When revival comes, fifthly and finally, when revival comes, people take God's word seriously and spread it to everyone in their lives. Verse 20 of our passage says, In this way the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. When revival comes, Respect for the scriptures increases. You know, sort of the opposite of what's been happening over the last century in our culture. There will be many fewer people saying, the Bible is just a book of myths. People will want to know if the Bible really is true. When they see all the evidence that we have, that we have today that it is, then they'll believe it rather than scoffing at it. People will be quoting the Bible all over the place. They'll be putting it on their houses, and they'll be putting it on their cars, and on their clothing, and in social media, and even in and on public buildings again. The Ten Commandments on courthouses will be back, back in vogue. And crosses on public land won't be a reason for a lawsuit anymore when revival comes. For when people turn to the Lord, they want to know more about him. They want to know him more. So they get into the word, and they become excited to find the truth and the wisdom written there. And as the word changes their lives, they become more holy and more joyful and more full of love. And people start to notice, and then those people want to hear the word. And the word grows in power among the people because they take it seriously. And when more and more people take God's word seriously, even whole cultures can change for the better. Do you want to be revived? Do you want to see revival come to your family and your community and your church and your nation? Get into the Word. Don't let that Bible sit on your bedstand or on the table or in your closet. Get it out and read it. Teach it to your children, to your grandchildren, to your friends and neighbors. When we see people 
getting into the word, having a desire, a thirst for God's word and taking it seriously and sharing it all over the place because they're so excited about it, then we will know that revival has come. The Holy Spirit moves in a mighty way in Ephesus, and a great number of people come to the Lord. The people begin to fear God. They respect the name of Jesus Christ. They repent and they confess their sins. They turn away from the love of money, and they take God's word seriously. May we see these same things in our hearts and lives, and in our church, and in our community, and in our culture, please God, and in our nation. For when we do, we'll know that finally, revival has come. Would you join me in prayer? Bring revival, O oh Lord. Please, we pray again to you. Pour your spirit out on us. Pour your spirit out on this community. Pour your spirit out on our nation, our culture. And bring change, we pray. That we might all be empowered to do your will and your work. To know you. To know your word. And to live lives pleasing to you. That we might be filled with love for you and your love for everyone else. Help us, Father. We need your help, and our whole community and culture needs your help. In the name of Christ, we ask. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn today is number 82 in your hymnal, Blessed Be the Name. Let's turn together to number 82. And we'll stand and sing, Blessed Be the Name.
Son, and the Holy Spirit. Rest and abide with each of us today and forever. And may we go from this place renewed, revived, to bring revival with us everywhere we go. In the name of Christ we ask this. Amen. Amen.